वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर के एस नागराजा ऑफ डेकन कॉलेज पुणे टीचिंग द कोर्स ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल लिंग्विस्टिक्स टूडेज मॉड्यूल डील्स विथ ए लैंग्वेज फैमिली दर इज इंडो ऑरियन लैंग्वेजेस एस ऑलरेडी वी हैव ऑब्जर्व इन द प्रीवियस मॉड्यूल Indo Aryan is a branch of Indo European. In fact, Indo European is probably the largest language family of the world. So in this module, we concentrate primarily on the Indo Aryan subbranch but taking starting from Indo Iranian subbranch. In fact, uh, Indo-Iranian is a branch of Indo-European and in the Indo-Iranian there are two sub branches Iranian and Aryan so Iranian and Aryan are more like sisters so we see that Aryan uh, naturally will have many features which are found in the Iranian at least in the initial stages so in this particular module we start from there and look at the similarities between them and then concentrate on the aryan section because obviously there will be many divergences from the iranian point of view and uh, study the at least one part of the aryan uh, branch because uh, aryan branch itself is very vast having uh, uh, innumerable languages and also spreading into many million so from linguistically scholars have uh, divided that into three periods normally known as old indo aryan middle indo aryan and new indo aryan so in this module we concentrate on the first one and then the other two will be taken up in the modules uh, which will follow indo aryan language is a branch of indo european language family the indo european languages are probably the biggest family in the world there are about 445 living indo european languages according to an estimate with uh, over 2/3 of them belonging to the indo iranian branch the most widely spoken indo european languages by native speakers are spanish english hindi portuguese bengali russian persian and punjabi each with over 100 million speakers today 46% of the human population speaks an indo-european language by far the most of any language family the indo-european family includes most of the modern languages of europe and parts of western central and south asia it was also predominant in ancient anatolia that is present day turkey and the ancient uh, tarim basin present day northwest china and most of central asia until the medieval turkic migrations and uh, mongol invasions with written evidence appearing since the bronze age in the form of the anatolian languages and the macedonian messenian greek the indo-european family is significant to the field of historical linguistics as possessing the second longest recorded history after the afro-asiatic family the indo-iranian languages or aryan languages constitute the largest and easternmost extant branch of the indo-european language family it has uh, more than 1 billion speakers stretching from the caucasus and the balkans balkan romani eastward to skingyang skingying sarikoli and assam of course assamese and south to the maldives maldivian 
the common ancestor of all the Indo-Iranian languages in this family is called Proto-Indo-Iranian also known as Common Aryan which are spoken in approximately the late 3rd millennium BC. The three branches of modern Indo-Iranian languages are Indo-Aryan or Aryan, Iranian and Nuristani. The Ardic languages are considered to be an archaic member of the Indo-Aryan branch. The oldest attested Indo-Iranian languages are Vedic Sanskrit that is ancient Indo-Aryan, older and younger Avestan and old Persian, ancient Iranian languages. A few words from another Indo-Aryan language that is Mitanni are, such, are attested in documents from the ancient Mitanni kingdom in northern Mesopotamia and Syria and the Hittite kingdom in Anatolia. An illustration is provided here to show the closeness of Avestan, the oldest form of Iranian branch, and Vedic Sanskrit, the oldest form of Aryan branch. The closeness of Avesta and Old Sanskrit is remarkably clear, though they are quite distinct individually. Also, the differences are clearly explainable. It may be remembered that the same illustration has been provided in the first module on the nature of historical linguistics. So the Western sample, Tam, Amavantam, Eshatam, Suram, Damohu, Savishtam, Mitram, Ejai, Jyotrabhyo. This is uh, taken from Jackson's uh, Avesta grammar. With certain phonetic uh, changes, it is possible, it is parallel to Vedic version Tam, Amavantam, Ejatam, Suram, Dhamahu, Dhamo, Dhamasu, Savishtam, Mitram, Eje, Hotribhya. So, uh, translations are provided and it is uh, so clear that both are very close to each other, more like sisters, only with some sound changes. The, the Iranian branch preferring for fricatives, whereas the Aryan one retains some of the aspirated stops and uh, a few other changes can be noted. The Northern Indo-Aryan languages evolved from Old Indic by way of the Middle Indic Prakrit languages and Upper Brahmsha of Middle Ages. Modern Indo-Aryan languages occupy the largest geographical area in the subcontinent. In this module, we discuss the Old Indo-Aryan stage followed by the other two stages in the next two modules. Old Indo-Aryan includes different dialects and linguistic states that are referred to in common as Sanskrit. The most archaic Old Indo-Aryan is found in Hindu sacred texts called the Vedas which date to approximately 1500 B BCE. There is a clear cut difference between Vedic and post Vedic Sanskrit in that the former has certain formations that are that the latter has eliminated. The grammarian Panini probably of 5th or 6th century BC appropriately distinguished between usage proper to the language of sacred texts called Chandas that is the Vedic usage and what occurs in the spoken language that is Bhasha or of, of his time. Other distinctions are also made within the language to, so scholars speak of classical Sanskrit and epic san Sanskrit. Despite differences in general, however, the Sanskrit found in such works generally agrees with the language Ponini describes. 
so-called unponinian forms not only reflect the influence of vernaculars but also continue a freedom of usage referred to as uh, arsha prayoga already to be seen in aspects of the living spoken language ponini described we now we take a look at the texts of old indo aryan or in other words ancient indian literature usually a distinction is made between ancient high indian and the others in the first one we have vedas and sanskrit in the first belong language of the oldest hymns and the mantras especially of those of the rigveda language of the later hymns and the mantras especially those of the other vedas besides the mantras occurring only in the brahmanas and sutras in the second belong ancient sanskrit the language of the vedic prose works with the exception of the mantras and of panini epic sanskrit the language of the popular epics classical sanskrit the language of the classical sanskrit literature after panini the vedic literature consists of three different classes of literary works and to each of these three classes belong a greater or a smaller number of separate works of of which some have been preserved but also many lost one samhitas that is collections namely collections of hymns prayers incantations benedictions sacrificial formulas and litanies two brahmanas voluminous prose texts which contain theological matter especially observations on sacrifice and the practical or mystical significance of the separate sacrificial rites and ceremonies three aranyaka that means forest texts and upanishads that is secret doctrines doctrines which are partly included in the brahmanas themselves or attached to them but partly are also reckoned as independent works four veda samhitas are in existence which differ clearly from each other and which have been preserved in one or more recensions the rigveda samhita rigveda is the veda or the knowledge of the songs of praise the earliest one of all the atharveda samhita it is of the knowledge of the magic formulas that is atharvam third the samaveda samhita of the knowledge of the melodies or saman fourth the yajurveda samhita of the knowledge of the sacrificial formulas that is ajus of which two rather strongly diverging texts are available one is krishna yajurveda samhita or known as black samhita includes taitariya samhita maitrayani samhita and b shukla yajurveda samhita or white yajurveda samhita includes vajasanei samhita the texts of the black yajurveda contain both verses used in rituals called mantras and prose sections that are explanatory in nature and that include legends mythological explanations of rites and the objects and deities associated with these rites and other matters together with etymologies accounts of the derivations of words to explain why certain things bear particular names these texts are known collectively as brahmanas since vedic age scientific analysis of language has preoccupied the indian mind the genesis of linguistic analysis can be traced in the vedic works like brahmanas upanishads shiksha shiksha means phonetics pratisakshas 
means beta rules, yaskas of 7th century BC, nirukta, there is etymology, such literatures are found. Grammatical studies have come down to us through different schools, including the famous school of Panini. Panini himself has referred to the names of his 10 predecessors who are Apishali, Kashyapa, Gargya, Galava, etc. However, most of them have been lost. All these grammarians have been eclipsed by the great Panini whose Astadhyaya still remains unsurpassed due to his comprehensiveness, perfection and scientific exactitude. Further, the chain of grammatical studies has continued and a number of non ponian schools of grammar flourished during 1st century AD to 14th century AD and among all of them, Katantra system of grammar is the, is the initial attempt where we find a lucid and clear exposition of a gradual development of Ponian system. Eight schools of grammar are commonly mentioned in India. Of this, Ponian system has long superseded all others. Shakatayanas and Jitendras are still known by existing manuscripts. Chandra or Chandra Gomin's grammar exists in a Tibetan version and four other schools of, uh, schools of Indra, Kashak, Kritna, Apishali and Amara are known by name or by an occasional quotation. Each Veda has one or more Brahmana connected with it. In addition, there are more philosophical Vedic works, the Upanishads, the, that is the Sessions and the Aranyakas, Book of the Forest. Also associated with the Vedas are ancillary works referred to as the six Vedangas, that is the limbs of the Veda. Among these are texts generally referred to as Kalpas, that is procedures, which are in turn made of several standard comp components. For instance, the principal aim of the components called Shrota Sutra, that is Revelation Sutras, is to provide instructions about ritual performance. Works on astronomy, Jyotisha, serves to assist in determining appropriate times for ritual performances. Matrix, the earliest work in which is ascribed to Pingala, describe metrical systems, patterns, a knowledge of which is necessary for the proper understanding of the Vedic mantras. The remaining three Vedangas are more linguistic. The Niruktas explain the etymology of words found in the Vedas by deriving them from verbal basis, thus showing how the remaining reflect association with particular actions. The earliest and most important of such works is the Nirukta of Yaska, commenting on sets of words in a collection called Nighantu, that is etymology. The Shiksha, that means phonetics, deal with the proper pronunciation of Sanskrit. Details of speech production are also found in works called Pratisaksha, which deal with the classification of sounds into phonological classes and with phonological rules serving to derive the continuously recited versions Samhita Pata of the Vedas from posited analyzed texts Padapata. The most ancient of these works are the Rigveda Pratisaksha and Taitariya Pratisaksha respectively associated with the Rigveda and the Taitariya Samhita. Then the Vajasaneyi Pratisaksha is associated with the Vajasaneyi Samhita, that is the recension of the white Yajurveda. The first two of these show no influence of Pananian techniques 
and stand a good chance good change of being good chance of being pre pananian the last is fairly certain to be post pananian at least in part grammars vakaranas concern the description of speech forms shabda considered to be correct sadhu through derivation and thereby serve to make understand the usage found in the vedas the grammar that was granted the status of vedanga is that of panini the work is also referred to as shabdanusasana since the core of panini's work comprises the eight chapters of sutras that serve to decide describe both the current language of his time and futures particular to vedic it also bears the name ashtadhyaye because it can, it is made up of eight chapters now we look at uh, the characteristic features of old indo aryan texts the accepted cultivated speech of the contemporary language that panini describes in his ashtadhyaye must have coexisted with more vernacular varieties of speech in which there were futures belonging to the middle indo aryan division of the language group several facts support this view the earliest texts available already show evidence of middle indo aryan for example vikata the form found in the rigveda used to be explained as representing a middle indic development of earlier Vik vikrata which at instead of rut the pandyan commentator katyayana probably of 3rd or 4th century bce knew of the coexistence of middle indic forms with earlier ones there is a pandyan rule that provides that verb bases listed in an appendix to the astadhyaye have the class name dhatu or verbal base root katyayana discusses whether one could define verbal bases semantically and thereby possibly do without the verb verb list he remarks that even if one defines a verbal basis as denoting an action the rules must be listed in order to preclude the possibility that constitutes of terms such as anapayati or anavayati commands be assigned the class name in question anapayati or anavayati is a middle indic counterpart of sanskrit agnyapayati commenting on what katyayana said patanjali belonging to mid 2nd century bce adds the examples of uh, vattati and vadhati which correspond to sanskrit vartate occurs uh, is and vardhate grows these forms show the use of the active ending ti instead of the middle ending te as well as the and dha for rta and ridha rid patanjali also explained that to speak flawless sanskrit as described by panini one should imitate the correct speakers called shishta or aryavarta country of the aryans moreover patanjali noted that one should study grammar in order to learn not to utter words such as helayaha instead of herayaha or gavi instead of gau gavi incidentally is a middle indo aryan word such evidence lends support to the view that by 6th or 5th century bce sanskrit as a medium of communication between members of a particular social stratum coexisted with middle indo aryan dialects and that depending on the circumstances either the higher or the more vernacular forms of speech were used further the pali canon records that the buddha enjoined his followers to use the vernaculars in communicating his teachings 
and the Jaina canon identif identifies Ardhamagadhi as the language to be employed for communicating the teachings of Mahavira. Similarly, Ashoka used Middle Indo Aryan, not Sanskrit, in the inscriptions he ordered written throughout his kingdom. Sanskrit does not appear on inscriptions until the early centuries of common era, for example, Rudadaman's inscription at uh, Junagar about 150 CE. The coexistence of Old Indo Aryan and Middle Indo Aryan is thus to be accepted from the Vedic times onwards. The current language Ponini described is very close in structure to the late Vedic found in certain Brahmana texts. Similarly, scholars have recognized other varieties of Sanskrit. Epic Sanskrit is so called because it is represented principally in the two epics Mahabharata and Ramayana. In the latter, the term Samskrita, adorned, cultivated, purified by grammar, is encountered probably for the first time with reference to the language. The date of composition for the core of early epic Sanskrit is considered to be in the centuries just preceding the common era. The term classical Sanskrit is generally used with reference to the language of major poetic works, words, works like Kavyas, Drama, Nataka, in which both Sanskrit and Prakrit were used, as well as tales such as the Hitopadesha and Panchatantra uh, and are used and also works of philosophy and rituals can be found. Not only was classical Sanskrit used by the poet Kalidasa and his predecessors Bhasa and Ashwaghosha, the first in the first centuries CE, but its use also continued long after Sanskrit was a commonly used as a mother tongue. So here we stop the class. Then the next section on the grammatical modifications uh, will be discussed in the next class. So the, to summarize then, Old Indo-Aryan stage of uh, Indo-Aryan is a very important one. In fact, uh, there are various controversies regarding the migration, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, there are lots of uh, materials available in the internet uh, regarding this topic. One may look at them. And uh, Old Indo-Aryan being close to Iranian sub-branch, uh, but later on gradually becomes more distinct from Iranian and develops its own idiom. Further, we see a, a lot of uh, wealth of literature composed in uh, old uh, Indo-Aryan, like uh, Vedic texts, for instance, Samhitas. And in fact, the comp composing of texts continues even at later stage, even when uh, the Vedic language changes to classical language, but then it becomes more of a court language rather than common man's language. So the further developments we will study in the next two modules. So the references mentioned will be, can be of great help to the students. Thank you.